Right, hello everyone. Um, hopefully you can all see my screen. Um, so if not, please have someone wave a hand or shout. Um, so thanks very much for the kind introduction, Kate. Um, yes, today I'm going to talk to you about um, uh, adapting and thriving in a changing landscape. Um, firstly, I'll give a very, very brief introduction because nobody wants to be bored listening to me talk about my business. But I think a brief introduction is always helpful just to get a, um, a view as to um, the, the basis in which I'm talking to you from. Um, then we'll discuss the main topic of the, um, uh, of the presentation and then I will leave you all with a brief thought to take away and hopefully contemplate. So, okay, so a very, very brief introduction. Um, Subtemo was set up in um, February 2019. Um, now, when I say set up, that was when my business partner and I left our safety of our paid employment and took the plunge into um, working on our own. Um, since then, so it's about two and a half years ago, um, we've built up, a, I think, a reasonable team. Um, we still have the two directors. We've now got a, one principal engineer, two senior engineers, one engineer, um, one graduate who we've just taken on board, uh, a, a BIM stroke CAD technician, and a part-time admin. Um, and part-time is like one day a week. So we, we work in a variety of sectors. Um, we were both uh, directors in previous um, uh, engineering practice for about 50 people. Um, so we have experience in several sectors and we work in distribution and warehousing. We do a lot of steel design for fabricators and contractors, um, including uh, sort of frame design and just uh, connection design. Um, we work in retail, both in refurbishment and new build. And, you know, we're talking about things as unglamorous as a, as a local convenience store to, um, you know, a new um, sort of relatively medium sized supermarket. So whole variety there. We work in the oil and gas industry, um, particularly in what's called brain field or the dirty side. We do well intervention, interfacing, decommissioning. We do modifications to drilling rigs um, and we do residential bespoke housing. We also do right down to the small businesses favorite, we'll do the beam over the bifold doors for a domestic extension. So adapting and thriving in a changing landscape. I think the first thing is that as engineers, we tend to fear change. Um, we might not admit it, but we do. So sometimes we just have to remind ourselves that actually changing environment is actually the main driver for evolution. And if the environment doesn't change, then everything stagnates. And I think sometimes when we're under the pressures of a changing world, it's, it's worth just sort of stepping back and considering that. So where are we gonna go in the future? What's gonna change? Well, one of the things I was taught when I was a young man with a full head of hair was that if you want to know what the future's gonna hold, then it's always a good start to have a look back and see what has changed and see if you can and build a bit of a pattern there. So what we, you know, what effectively, let's have a look back and see what's changed in, even in, in my career. And as you can tell, I'm no spring chicken. So when I started working in the 1990s, um, personal computers were a relatively new thing. Um, the only immediate form of um, written communication that you could send was via a fax machine. Um, Mobile phones were really very, very early days, just starting. Um, so first text messages sent. Um, we were starting to draw on AutoCAD, although many people were still drawing on drawing boards. And here's a thing for the young ones. There were things called libraries in which there were physical books. Once we moved into the 2000s, um, email came along. And I'm sure many of us now think, blimey, was there a world before email? Um, and yes, there was. Um, Windows XP sort of revolutionized the way that we work with PCs. The first camera phone was invented. Um, Revit actually started right way back in the early 2000s. And it was also the start of co-working with flexible office spaces. 
In the 2010s, um, BIM really started to take hold. Um, smartphone technology came on the, on the scene. That's the first iPhone. Um, Revit moved to Revit architecture. Um, Skype enabled people to meet remotely and see each other. Um, point cloud 3D surveys um, really started to be developed and um, data became more commonly stored on the cloud. In other words, there was a faster internet and far more opportunities. So where are we now? Well, I mean, there's so much you can discuss, but the key things I think is that we all have Microsoft Teams and Zoom. I mean, we're meeting today on Zoom. Revit, AutoCAD, Tecla structures have moved on so much. And there are others, so, you know, forgive me if I'm not mentioning your favorite, but there are such good drawing, detailing and modeling softwares available. And um, similarly, we analyze and design our structures in a variety of um, very powerful, um, relatively inexpensive softwares. Um, we can survey things via drone now. If we want to know something, we can go on the internet and look it up. We don't have to go to a library. And the biggest change that I see at the moment is the climate emergency. It's been here for a long time, but now we are finally sitting up and taking note. So when we look at what's changed in the last 25 to 30 years, we can break them down into these main headings. Communications have become faster, more direct, less personal. Um, there's no out of hours calls and emails are common. Um, and, and our clients and contacts expect immediate responses. But the plus side of all that is projects can now be carried out across multiple nations and even time zones. Technology has enabled far more complex analysis to be carried out more quickly. Structures are now quick to model in a 3D stroke 4D space. And as computational technology has advanced, so have our clients' expectations. Our environmental responsibility is now an integral part of structural engineering. Efficient design now includes our embedded carbon dioxide as well as monetary value. And social changes have affected how we work, when we work, and where we work. So other notable changes, this is the good old favorite that all engineers moan about, fees have reduced in real terms. And at the same time, client expectations have increased. Engineers provide less attendance on site, and this has affected quality of construction. So project and design turnaround has become quicker, more reliance upon contractor designed elements, and an increase in modular and off-site construction. So bearing all that in mind, what do we think the future is going to look like? Well, these are my thoughts. Communications are going to continue to expand upon mul across multiple platforms. And businesses will become populated by the TikTok generation. Oh, and I've just noticed I've missed an H out of what. So <laughs> what does this mean for the continued use of email? We've all got businesses at the moment that are so reliant upon email as the main form of written communication and our storage and um, record of those conversations. So how will project communications and records of important instructions and decisions be stored and filed? And with this change in communication, how will interpersonal business relationships be built and maintained? Relationships are such a big part of what we do. So I think the day-to-day -day technology will continue to develop and AI will become more integral within our analysis and design software. The whole way in which we model, analyze and design structures is likely to change. AI will potentially lead to greater insight into structural behavior and as such inform structural arrangements and solutions. More buildings may be modularized and constructed off site. As such, as an engineer, we will need to be more aware of the detailed interactions and the interfaces. How everything goes together is going to be even more important. And then desktops and monitors are going to become obsolete. We don't know when, but they will. And, you know, as I'm sure virtually all of us now are relying totally on them 
the, the whole environment in which we work is, in my opinion, going to change. Environmentally, we're going to have to take major steps if we're going to actually be net carbon zero by 2050. We're also, at the same point, we're going to have to design for more extreme climate change events. We'll need to find ways of making existing structures serviceable, as both in changing needs and changing use and changing conditions. Um, and we must improve, strengthen, insulate and mitigate existing buildings and infrastructure against the effects of climate change. And embedded and operational um, carbon dioxide is going to have significant real world costs, um, whether by taxation or other forms, it will have an actual financial cost attached to it at some point. So socially, what's likely to happen? Well, there's more questions here than thoughts. How will we interact? Where will we work? When will we work? A collaboration in a shared physical, physical space is, in my opinion, currently vital for developing rounded, well-rounded engineers. So, you know, hopefully people will agree. If not, I'm keen to hear, but I, I think it's very difficult to train or be trained remotely. I think you need to be sharing the same space. So, you know, I think there's a real challenge there. So bearing all that in mind, we have to ask ourselves, well, how are we going to move forward? And I've, I've had two thoughts about that. So I've kind of thought, well, what are our options? And I think option one is actually, we just need to learn. We need to be flexible. We need to invest in the future and we need to excel in what we do. There is an option too, which is change profession, go into wealth management and be unfulfilled. Now, I only put this in because we share a building with some people in wealth management and one of them drives that Porsche and I'm sure they drink the champagne. Um, but anyway, seriously, what do we need to do? Well, we need to run good, flexible businesses. We need to invest in the future. We need to grow and develop. Because again, if we don't grow and develop, we stagnate. And if we stagnate, we regress. And we need to maintain high quality. So how do we do good business? Well, we stay lean and keep control of our overheads. Don't forget, we are service providers. Most clients actually don't know how good the engineering is. We wish they did, but they don't. What they know is how good the service is. We all have phones. Let's use them. How many times have we seen that emails are slightly misinterpreted and both sides, both receiving and sending, and they can often be cold and passive aggressive. And actually our whole way in which we run businesses is about relationships. So let's be aware of that. And be aware of wasted marketing. Now I don't mean all marketing, I'm just talking about spend your time and effort where it really counts, where you're gonna get success. Um, in a past life as a director in another firm, I spent huge amounts of time chasing things that were never going to happen. Um, oh, sorry, and learn from your mistakes. Um, you know, we all make mistakes, use them, treat them as an asset. So invest in our people. The, um, the you know, employing staff is time consuming, expensive and inherent risks. So therefore, retain and motivate your team. Well, the good ones anyway. Um, Training and CPD, we need to keep up to date. We need to keep up to date with new materials, the latest techniques, the updated codes, safety issues. We can learn so much from Cross and SCOS, and we need to keep up to date with the um, effects of embodied carbon and how to reduce it. And we need to encourage individuals' developments and career progression. We need to mentor people, support them, and fund them. And flexible working, does it actually work for your business? We've got to be honest. However much staff might not like this, we do run businesses and not charitable social clubs. We need to remember that. So invest in software and IT equipment. The correct balance of what we need to maximize efficiency and the work we do without getting more than we're going to use. Software is a big cost. Other than people, it's probably one of our biggest costs. So let's pay for exactly what we need. Um, and in doing so, we keep our maintenance and support costs in check, which goes back to the first point about keeping control of your overheads. But most importantly, ensure software is used correctly. 
don't assume software is idiot proof, it's not. So I think businesses have to grow or stagnate. Uh, and again, I'm sure many people listening will disagree, but this is my view. You either grow or you stagnate. Because I think two brains are better than one. And a diversity of views tends to result in better decisions. I believe that we need to build and maintain harmonious but honest relationships based on trust and respect and share and learn. What we've found, even since we've set up our business, is join small business forums, connect with other people, collaborate with the competition. You know, it sounds counterintuitive, but take time to attend conferences and networking because there is plenty of work for all of us. There genuinely is. So don't be fearful of sharing experiences and helping each other. I think it's genuinely useful. I think you gain as much as you, as you give. And, so, and the other thing is don't be afraid to step outside of your comfort zone. Designing solutions to new problems is hugely rewarding. But never forget, know what you don't know. Because as long as you know what you don't know, you can go and find out. And if you don't know what you don't know, that's when you're going to make mistakes. So evolve and grow. And I think we've got to provide the highest quality. Um, up at the truth, we're all judged by our worst job, never by our best. It's a sad fact of life. And when, not if it goes wrong, put it right quickly. Be available and keep in touch. Try to avoid bottlenecks in your business. Let go of some things. Don't hold things back and empower your team to bring new ideas and technologies, manage clients, run projects, grow their skills and confidence, and be proud of what you do and what you produce. So as we rushed our way through that, a final thought. What does it mean to be an engineer? Now, I must admit, I've, I've actually picked this up from a, a recent WhatsApp group from our friends in the United Arab Emirates group and um, just expanded on it slightly. What does it mean to be an engineer? Well, actually, many people think engineer comes from the word engine. It doesn't. It comes from the French German, which I'm not going to try and pronounce because I will no doubt get it wrong, which actually in turn comes from the Latin, which is to create, contrive and generate, which also comes from cleverness. So if we accept that engineers are, by definition, ingenious, we can deal with anything. Whatever the future holds, we can deal with it. And that, with about 30 seconds to go, was my closing slide.